Seigu Sewagoigu, Hanna Klaus Janjats. Jokjagi Gideru, Gainigehaga Danu Ozeroni, Zegadeu Yesta, Jatdiwawa Nodan, Danu Garastanius. Hello to everybody, welcome. My name is Hannah Claus. I live in Montreal. I'm Gainigehaga uh, and uh, English heritage. I am learning our words and I'm an artist. I'd like to thank and acknowledge the hard work of all the staff at the Dunlop, uh, Jennifer, Wendy, Sasha, Eric, and particularly Jeff and Jesse, who've been working on installing the work. I'd like to thank Gahunda Horn Miller for the text. She asked that uh, you read it out loud. The text will be available upstairs. Um, I was really happy. I haven't had her write about my work before. Uh, she's someone that Jennifer suggested, and uh, I, I was very happy. Um, I think it's interesting because she writes about it from a uh, Gatnigahaga perspective, um, someone who's Mohawk. When I say Gatnigahaga, that uh, means people of the flint. It's the, the name by which we call ourselves, as opposed to the name by which we are called. Uh, the people of the flint are one of six nations of the Haudenosaunee. The Haudenosaunee are the people of the Longhouse, and uh, the Gatnigahaga are the keepers of the eastern door of that Longhouse, meaning they're the ones at the easternmost tip. I would like to acknowledge and thank Adam Martin, uh, director of the Gewawak Collective, who partnered with the Dunlop Library to make my workshop tomorrow there's a workshop tomorrow. <laughs> workshop tomorrow possible as a part of the 2020 Storytellers Festival. Uh, I'd like to thank the Canada Council for the Arts, the Conseil des Arts de Montréal, and the Conseil des Arts et des Lettres du Québec for their generous support that has led to the creation of many of the works that you'll see in the exhibition tonight. I'm honored to be here with you on the territories of the Nehiawak, Anisinapek, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Métis Nation. There has been travel, trade, and relationship between our people since, and I was going to say time immemorial, because this kind of sounds like where you should say that, but then I looked it up, and here's where I get tricky with my PowerPoint. I looked it up, and I just felt the definition, the words, and words are important, that they didn't really fit. Um, time immemorial, meaning beyond the reach of memory, record, or tradition, indefinitely ancient. I don't think that's true. I don't think that uh, this idea is beyond memory. Um, the idea of memory, the land has memory, they remember. There are those who remember. There are ways to remember, and the ancestors remember. So that didn't work for me. The other definition was in law, uh, a legal definition. It goes back to King Richard I and the Statute of Westminster. And then again, I say, well, I don't know that that's the person or the structure that should be defining um, these ideas, these concepts, which I believe belong to a different worldview. So instead, I'll say that there's been tra trade, travel, and relationship between our peoples since before the creation of highways, before the imposition of borders, titles, and names. There's been travel, trade, and relationship between our peoples for as long as the rivers have been flowing. And I'm honored to be a guest in your land. Thank you. So this is my version of a territorial acknowledgement. Um, I think these are best when they come from a personal perspective, uh, reflections, the reflections and extensions of us. And these are the ideas that are at the heart of my artistic practice and the exhibition. Um, I decided I didn't want to show you images of the works themselves. When I first knew that I was going to do a talk, I just sort of assumed it would be in the exhibition. And then I heard amphitheater, and I said, oh, okay, it's not there. Well, it, 
It doesn't seem right to show you images of the work uh, when I would like you to go up and see the work, but I am going to uh, talk to you about the ideas that inform the work. A lot of my work comes from uh, different relationships with people, uh, encounters with people, relationships with objects, and ideas. So this is what we're going to look at. I'm also not one much for sitting, so I hope that doesn't mess up the... Nope, you're yeah. good. Okay. You're great. <laughs> so the first image um, is one that inspired, it's at the base of, uh, the bases of the prints that you'll see upstairs that are called the root that Osterkapp preferred. Um, the image is uh, a map. The map was created in 1754 by La Verandrie, a French colonialist, explorer, fur trader, and it's the European cartographic expression of the map that's actually included at the top here. This is a separate map, and this is the map um, as far as I could find out, it's the one example of a, a map that's remaining that still exists that was inscribed on birch bark with uh, charcoal, charred wood, uh, by um, Ochagach, is how his name is recorded in Leverandry's journals. He's the Cree guide that worked with Leverandry to uh, do the different routes. This is the route between Lake Superior to Lake Winnipeg. And it's a route that he preferred that went through what's now the United States, as opposed to uh, through the Canadian territory. And um, La Verandrie was so impressed, the relationship between them was such that he included that map uh, as an homage, and maybe as a citation, um, to the European vision below, which I thought was really just beautiful. So it's one of the things that uh, forms a part of the series of prints uh, upstairs. The prints upstairs were done during a residency at the Arizona State University. I'm not a printmaker, but lucky me, I get invited sometimes to work with printmakers. And uh, this is something that uh, developed out of that residency. The name uh, that Le Verandry uses is Ochagash, and it says that this is an anglicized, Europeanized version of the name. And again, I, I thought that was interesting. I wanted to try and get his name back, re-find re his name. So I uh, talked with Neil McLeod, um, a Nikia speaker, and asked if he had any leads, had any ideas. So he went and talked to his language teachers and it was in talking with them that they came up with the name Osikak, and it means crane. They thought that would be possible. So that's what the title comes from. Um, though I'm gonna say, when I was just looking up uh, the map tonight to uh, get you the source material, I saw there's a new thing, there's a, a new thing that happened June 2019. There's some filmmakers that are trying to like launch a film based on the relationship of Ochagach and La Verandrie, uh, a bit of a documentary. And they listed the name as being something that would mean star, Ochakos, or little spirit or little soul, Akak, Akakos. So those are all possibilities, which I think are interesting and important to note. That's one thing that in my research with language and teachings is to be open to these different interpretations, the different possibilities um, of, of, of what it might be. This is a detail of the prints. So I'm cheating a little bit, I am showing you a little bit of the work. But just to give you a sense, um, the map I didn't take it literally. Um, I sort of played, turned it around. North is south, south is north. It's not following a, a specific layout in that sense. But it was in part to talk about how the world really turned upside down at this point. Things were no longer the way that they knew and understood them with contact. 
Um, there's a little bit there too. You can see that's uh, copper. There's a hole punch, um, which is the Pleiades constellation is hole punched into the prints as well. That's just a little part of it uh, with copper backing, uh, talking about the influence of the stars in, in map making as well. And this idea of mapping um, and journey comes up again. It's something that uh, came up when I was in Edmonton. I think it was 2016. Uh, and I was there to meet with uh, other artists for a competition for the, um, the indigenous sculpture park that Edmonton wanted to, to launch at the time. And it was really quite something, of, they had a bunch of us, um, Candace Hopkins was one of the consulting curators, and we'd, there'd been an open call, and we applied if we were interested with our ideas, and they brought a bunch of us up to meet for the weekend in Edmonton to learn about the site, to learn about the place and the communities and people, and it was really fascinating. So we're sort of all sitting around the table, and I, I, I know a lot of different people, the indig indigenous art community is small, we know each other and kind of meet up, but these different uh, exhibitions and things. And everyone's sort of talking about, oh, well, I'm from this place and connected to here, or my family's from there, or they, I was here at this time. That Everyone had connections. And we kind of went around to talk about, uh, you know, who we were, we introduced ourselves at the beginning, who we are and why. And I sort of said, well, I don't really have a connection to here. I just thought it sounded like a great idea. Um, and I love the idea of an indigenous uh, sculpture park, but I'm from Montreal and I have never been to the West or to Edmonton to this place before. And uh, that's where um, the Cree elder, Jerry Saddleback, and the Dene elder, John Janvier, were both like, no, it's, it's important that you're here. There's a connection between this place and Montreal and uh, they talked about the site as being a site where the uh, people would prepare through ceremony to then travel across the continent and uh, engage in trade. And they talk about trade as being ceremony. So I thought this, this idea is so counter to how we understand trade in a Western sense. It's an economic transaction. It's the, Euro the European Union. It's the North American Free Trade Act. It's, it's stocks and bonds. It, you know, it's, it's, it's economic. So the idea of trade as relationship really had me thinking. And uh, they would say, you know, this is, it led to this series of prints. So these prints aren't in, in the show, but are sort of informing other pieces that are in it. But uh, I sort of told the story through this series of prints. So Dene and Cree elders told me their people regularly engaged in trade with other nations throughout the continent. The runners were prepared mentally, physically, and spiritually from birth to undertake this role. In the Dene language, the word for the place we know as Montreal is Ho Shelaga, where many nations gather. The elders said they would travel east to trade with the Mohawk for their tobacco and canoes. They said we had good tobacco. The Gantengehaga built fires at the edge of the woods to their territory where visitors would wait to be received. You remember who are the Gantengehaga? People of the Flint, yes. Fluent Gantengehaga speakers identify Hoshalaga as Otzira Gani at the fire. The Gantengehaga are the people of the Flint and the keepers of the Eastern Door. So this was a way of kind of bringing those two stories together because I was all excited when I heard about uh, the Dene calling Ho Shilaga as being Montreal. Um, in part because you'll see the outline uh, that this is on is a commemorative plaque 
and it's the commemorative plaque from the uh, Hochelaga Rock that's on the McGill campus. And that was erected, I think in 1925 or something, but it was erected because they'd found uh, remains of an Iroquoian village, and they said, this must be Hochelaga. And I don't know about you, but when I was little, that was like the one little bit of indigenous history I got was the idea of Jacques Cartier arriving, finding Hochelaga, discovering it, meeting the people. Then he leaves, and 40, year late, 40 years later, Champlain comes. Hochelaga is nowhere to be seen, so they say this mysterious people must have been killed in warfare with others or died off from some sort of disease, but they're never seen again and it becomes Montreal. So that's sort of the, the version in the history books. And for Jean Janvier to be telling me Roche Laga is what we call it where many nations gather, I thought, well, what if Cartier was speaking to a Dene, right? And so they would, they would travel and engage in trade. The travel is long. They stay for sort of 12 to 18 months, and then when the signs are right, they then return to Dene territory. So what if Cartier was speaking to a Dene? And when Champlain came back, well, that wasn't the time for them to be there. It's an idea. So I went and talked to, um, to uh, my, my contacts at Ganasatagi. And they're like, no. No, no. <laughs> so this is where I have the other story coming in of the Ganigahaga and Otsirakani about the keepers of the fire and uh, uh, the idea of the fire at the edge of the woods where visitors would wait to be received. So these are different voices. It's important to have the different voices coming in. And I am going to say, just because I said maybe Cartier was talking to a Dene, doesn't mean the Gahaga were already there. But things being as they are now, we're just going to say no to that one. So a lot of my work is talking about voice, talking about language, talking about memory, history, ways of seeing or understanding things. Um, Last year, I did a residency. I was artist in residence at the McCord Museum. If uh, any of you are familiar with Montreal, uh, the McCord, it's kind of the social history museum is how it builds itself now. Um, and it's really of, of Montreal and of the, the place there. But McCord himself was a great collector of uh, indigenous uh, objects. And uh, I think I was, I was fully even has a, uh, a Gahaga name, I don't know what it is, but one of the, the conservatives there was, was telling me that. So um, I was interested in working with, with the objects, but I went in with the, uh, the intention to look at mapping and uh, sort of trade, because they also have ledgers from the Northwestern Fur, Fur Trade Company and, and maps and things. And I just thought, let's continue working with this idea of mapping and um, I'd like to see sort of more indigenous presence. So I get there and the ledgers are very thick with, with the thousands and thousands of beaver pelts and uh, otter and lynx and all kinds of, of furs. It's amazing. But there isn't an indigenous voice. It's all written in sort of copper plate, uh, old French, old English, and um, it was funny, I realized that I had, that I'd, I'd really not, I'd become unaccustomed to reading writing in that way. I was getting very frustrated with having to just decipher it, these sort of long symbols attached words and, and figuring it out. And I could, of course, read it. I could, I could read it. But it, uh, it was a bit of a struggle. It wasn't something that sort of came easily or not sure, they had sort of notes uh, from the, the, the owner at the time, just sort of correspondence that was between him uh, ordering different things. Um, I put this one in for David, Louis Riel's Testament. So 
that's a little bit for, I don't know how, well, he does have connection to Montreal, but I was really quite surprised to realize that it was there. But, uh, yeah, so anyway, this is, this is the, the writing that I found, and I didn't find Indigenous voice. So, one of the works that then came out of this, uh, that was because the idea of being artist in residence is you have an exhibition um, based on your interaction with the objects. One of the works that came out from this was called um, Trade is Ceremony. And that's in thinking back to the conversation with Jerry. And as well, uh, the imagery that I used with that is um, based on wampum symbols, symbols that are found in wampum belts. Um, to me, that's one of the languages that I know of uh, that's used by, um, by the Haudenosaunee, by the Anishinaabe. Um, it's a common language that's found in wampum belts. Are you familiar with wampum belts? Some people, yes? Okay, I'll explain a little bit. Um, they're made with shell beads. These are the shells. Uh, it's freshwater shells. And they um, are a way of, it's a memory aid to the oral agreements, basically. Um, but the, the thing with the wampum is that uh, they're woven on looms and everything has a meaning. So this is my friend Alan Corbier. He is an Anishinaabe historian uh, and he's presently completing his PhD, but he does a lot of wampum teaching and that's with a replica belt. So you can see it's woven uh, and it's called a belt simply because it kind of looks like a belt shape, but they're not worn as belts and it's purple and white beads uh, that are made from the shells. The uh, symbols are agreed upon, the number of beads, the width, the length, everything has a meaning and it's decided upon the parties that are making the agreement together. It's nation to nation agreements or also for governance for Haudenosaunee. You'll also notice that the um, warp on the end is left long that's intentional. It's not just because they just cut it and didn't finish it. It's intentional. It symbolizes that these words are continuing. It's an active agreement. It's not one that is static or finished finite in time. It needs to keep on living. So that's very important. In my work where I do installations, I have threads that go from the floor to the ceiling. That's to talk about that idea of relationship and connection that the, those sort of wampum uh, structures talk about. Um, these are some, of, some wampum belts that uh, I used in an installation for Queen's University. It's to talk of the sort of symbols that come up, the diamonds refer to nations or council fires, uh, the paths, the rows, we'll talk about connection. Um, the thicker the row, the stronger the relationship. The thinner, um, the more sort of tenuous. There's the one dish, one spoon is the second one in. Uh, the dish refers to the land. I counted, it's actually that dish is made up of 13 rows, which refers to the 13 moons in a year. The white part in the center is the beaver's tail, which is the delicacy that is prepared for your guests that are coming into your territory. You always serve them the best of what you have and you always leave a little in the dish for the next person who comes. Um, so yeah, so these are all part of the different symbols for reading. Um, one of the ones, the one on the end, the kind of funky one called Old Fort, that one, um, we don't know its meaning anymore. The meaning's been lost. but. I thought that was important to include as well, to remember that these are words that need to be remembered. So that's just an image of the, uh, the installation at Queen's. Um, that was for the uh, legal, the, the law department, faculty of law. And uh, it's uh, acrylic sheets, transparent and translucent acrylic to uh, talk about, think about this idea of wampum belts.
So within my blankets that are the um, the trade is ceremony, I use copper pins, and um, the copper pins are something that's the raw element. It's uh, really of the earth. I kind of think of it as sort of the the heart blood uh, of the earth. Um, it's also a conductive metal, right? So it's communication that works as well. And uh, it's also bright and shiny, and I like it. And I have always had this thing with my work where you sort of growing up uh, as an artist, you go to art school and you're told, pretty doesn't matter, we don't want that. <laughs> um, it's concept, it's ideas. Um, this is the kind of thing that was happening when I was at art school. So you sort of felt like I am, you know, you, you weren't allowed to do that, to, to just admit that something is beautiful and that beauty has a right to exist. I actually did my undergrad uh, in drawing and painting and sculpture. I was always kind of in between the two, but I couldn't go into the really rigorous just concept. I couldn't give up kind of the aesthetic appeal of painting, and so I ended up in installation. <laughs> And uh, I like to say that I like to transform space with my work. But I also want to add that um, as more writing comes around about Indigenous art, this idea of beauty is a legitimate one. It's a strategy. It's a way to honor the ideas and the objects. Um, and I use it as a strategy to bring people in to my spaces. This is some of the objects from the McCord. Their piece that's in the vitrine that you'll see in the front window is called a uh, fancy dance shawl for Sky Woman. And it was, it is made up of photographic images of this beadwork. These are things that I hadn't ever seen before. I know the McCord pretty well, um, living in Montreal and I go there. And uh, these are called uh, cradleboard wrappers. So for the babies uh, being wrapped in this just beautiful sort of heavily beaded silky, I mean, it's, it's to, to show the importance of the child. It's that thing where you say the justification for taking indigenous children from their families was to say that they didn't know how to care for babies or children. It's just crazy. Children are honored as the most precious being coming from the stars that, that there, there is. So it's just very elaborate. These are sort of more Victorian influenced raised beadwork, but they don't get shown because they're too fragile. So I was felt very special that I was able to see them. This one is actually um, silver. It's all silver elements used instead of beads. Tarnished. If you remember what I said about the wampum agreements, um, it hasn't been kept active and alive by keeping, keeping it polished and keeping it uh, silvered. But it's actually made from uh, different brooches and pins that uh, would be traded with um, with Europeans in, uh, in, in Montreal. And they would cut them down and adapt them into making them into, into the beading patterns, the decorative patterns. And to me, this idea of those copper elements that I have, I actually found them on a website when I was looking for beads. I buy on the websites. And uh, jewelry making, and they're copper head pins. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with them. I just thought that looked like fun, bright and shiny, I'm gonna do something with that, and I ordered a whole bunch of them, and they ended up now as a part of these blankets. And that's the end of the images. There's still more work up there that I could talk about. How are we doing for time? Like you're, you can talk for another five, 10 minutes if you want, and then we can take questions. Sure, okay. Yeah. So. So yeah, so that's um, uh, for the images, because again, I didn't want to show you what they actually were, but there are two video components, two video 
installations um, in the in the exhibition. Um, when I use video, I do it as installation. I don't usually do it um, to be shown on a monitor or, or, or a screen. So there's a wall projection, which is a close-up of the St. Lawrence. And it really is quite large because, again, I want you to feel like you're, you're coming into it. Um, background to that, I could tell you, I could have put like a newspaper headline. When uh, a couple of years ago, the flooding was really, really bad in the spring and uh, a lot of the areas of, around um, Gamasatage and Oka um, along that Ottawa River were just flooded out. So uh, this was the first nice day after all of the rain and I went out to film. And uh, the water was really brown and not very, very good looking, um, which wasn't great. But the birds were so happy. They were just going crazy with the sunshine and the nice weather. So the birds were part of the soundtrack because they needed to to be there and have their voices heard. Um, and the, uh, the close-up on the water is really the sunlight sparkling on the water, but it gradually changes to constellation uh, and, and nighttime um, to talk about sort of that, that cycle, the connection between the river that flows, the shells that come from the bottom of the ocean, and that rise up to the sky with the smoke of the pipe as the words are sealed into the welcome belts. So, I'll finish with that.